Okay. Okay, I think this is on screen. Hello, Evolution Hour, yet again, old RJ is back. And uh, there's more clickety-clacks and rattle-tattles and typewriters. Remember typewriters? Remember analog clocks? Isn't that exciting? It's the past. Uh, I'm RJ Downer, Troubles in Paradise, TortukanWordPress.com. If you don't have it on your uh, desktop or linkage on your uh, smartphone, well, why the hell not? Anyway, uh, there is our opening show. And let me close that down. Remember, I, as an old fart, uh, I uh, have the, the deals of uh, limited capability on the computer and so forth and so on. So I try to do the best I can with what I have. Hello, gang. We've got uh, Insects Are Cool and uh, Nyanya and others. Hopefully, we'll be watching in due course or catching us later on this. I didn't hear back from Jackson Wheat, who I wanted to uh, have continuing discussions on regarding our new book. Rocks uh, were there, but uh, I think he's probably uh, busy with school. Uh, in the time zone in Louisiana. So, uh, hi, Jackson. Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> the usual um, opening spiel uh, to remind you what it is this particular series is about. Been going on for quite a long time as I've been plowing through Contested Bones, which is this creationist book that was sent to me to do this very thing, which is to analyze it from a source methods direction. And that is to find out what sources it was using, what arguments it was making on it, are those sources valid or not, which meant compiling a reference bibliography and tracking down all that stuff. And it's been a consistent pattern. Um, they're uh, heavily reliant on authority quoting and secondary sources of the technical literature they cite. Uh, about half of it is misrepresenting because it's leaving stuff out that they should be addressing the issues of. And at the moment, their chapter is on Homo naledi, which was the uh, fossils that have been found relatively recently, 2015 on, uh, that were trapped in this cave. Uh, and um, it turned out to be fabulous because there were a lot of different samples, and it looks like they were deliberately buried there uh, rather than just accidentally dropped in or some animal picked them up and dropped them in. And that means very complex behavior including the ability to carry fire torches down into the caves because the, the area apparently was still unavailable uh, for just walking in, even when it was around when these animals, uh, the hominids were around, uh, what, a couple hundred thousand years ago or more. And um, uh, the um, problem is, is that in the creationist point of view, everything has got to be in uh, uh, either a human being or not human. So you're either on the pure ape side, so Lucy, the Australopithecines and all that are pushed over onto the ape side. And then, then there's this vacuum of trying to pull everything on the Homo side, the our genus, uh, into uh, Homo sapiens, or maybe not. And so it's a big vacuum where Neanderthals are just human beings, and Homo erectus is just human beings, and Homo naledi are just human beings. Never mind that their anatomy doesn't fit. And so there's just a colossal amount of evasion going on. And the fact, the, the right up front evasion is that, that I can't find any instance of anybody who is writing on any side of this issue from the regular scientific point of view who disputes now that it's a separate species, Homo naledi. And nobody is saying, no, these are just actually strangely deformed human beings. Uh, the chronology is a little awkward anyway because they're now dated far enough back that, that this is really before humans are spreading out in the out of Africa thing. Uh, yeah, frustrated atheist says uh, everything is either humans or primates except when it's not. And that that's the fun part when you look at the older creationist literature and to some extent current creationist literature uh, because so much of it's parasitical uh, that uh, if you do a grid of what they think these animals are specifically and which skulls and which uh, uh, fossils they attribute to humans or not. There's not a lot of agreement as to what they are within the creationist literature. And that's because they're just flailing around. They're trying to pigeonhole. They're not really doing it on systematics, which is just hilarious. Anyway, um, as the, the, the big bugbear that I do on uh, source methods is primary sources, damn it. You want to look at primary sources whenever possible. And this can be a, a, a secondary analysis is a primary source for its own content. And a primary source is primary source for its content. 
So you can uh, look at, uh, say, a National Geographic summary or a, um, a commentary article in science or, or uh, proceedings in the National Academy of Sciences or uh, any websites. And those are perfectly legitimate things to take note of. But you will always remember that there is a technical paper theoretically behind it. And so ideally, you want to look at the original source material. So I put up again, I think I'd done a Van Wick's uh, example before uh, because it was telling more of the story and why Homo naledi is Homo naledi and not Homo sapiens. And uh, um, here we get another authority quoting again from uh, our dear pals, Samford and Rupi, who um, uh, just simply trot out the same material. And uh, they're just uh, presuming by this time, absolutely positively, that Homo naledi is just a normal human being that doesn't look quite normal. And they scavenge around little teeny parsing the bones, which I've discussed in the last few weeks to try to think, well, this is within the range of human beings, but as a whole package, no, it isn't. And there's enough variation on it that nobody is regarding it as Homo sapiens. Uh, a frustrated atheist says, primary sources, you mean I can't take AIG at face value? Blasphemy. That's the fun part of source analysis, is that if you have the stomach for it, uh, by all means, read the creationists. Oh, yeah, read the creationists, because they are a goldmine for investigating their bad method. And you'll be able to see the difference between what goes on in the regular science community and what goes on in the creationist thing. Not everybody can stand reading lots and lots and lots of creationist literature. I do that in my tip project because that's what it's all about, is I want to know exactly what's said and by whom and where. And um, uh, so, but the creationists who are trying to cite technical literature, and that's what Rupi is doing, is trying to argue that the science literature supports their argument. And the only way they can do that is by parsing it. So they, they've got to avoid material that doesn't fit their narrative and skip past stuff. There's a wacky um, inconsistency to some of the material. I've noticed that there was an article that, that was in um, National Geographic and also online, and they would cite it repeatedly, sometimes the geographic print version and sometimes the online version. There was no consistency to it. In other cases, um, uh, uh, things were given with uh, inadequate... Uh, source referencing, and later on they cite the very same thing with an actual web link to it. Uh, so there's a, a certain amount of clutter and clumsiness uh, to um, uh, Rupi that I know I try to avoid in my own work, where you want a consistent bibliographic format, you want to have a consistent um, source citation format, you want to have a clear uh, coordinated indexing system so that you can find the information quickly in the reader. Well, they don't do that. They don't even have a bibliography or an index, so it's pretty pretty pathetic. Um, so uh, um, everybody can look up the the one paper I put in particularly is the um, uh, uh, very detailed geological paper that they cited that went into uh, the dating and forensics of it. And they and and you'll notice, unlike the creationists that basically present their carping of anti-evolution, and yet they don't really make too clear what they think happened in specific cases. Exactly the opposite is occurring in, in the Dirks paper, where they're offering every possible alternative to the what they contend is the case and offer the reasons for or against it, and rigorously so. And that's what real science does. Now, the, because these animals apparently are being deliberately buried, and maybe even some ritual aspects to it, that uh, it suggests a level of cognitive um, activity that's really interesting if it's an offshoot of Homo erectus and uh, and or even some australopithecines that there's ritual behavior and intelligence in a relatively small brained animal. Well, that doesn't fit their narrative, the creationist narrative, where burial things being done by a not yet human is not possible. No, no. Only humans are soulish creatures. Only humans can do such things. Only humans can make art. So everything, all of this activity must be done by humans. And therefore, they have to look past the fact that, boy, this is an unusual suite of behavior on here. Uh, Naledi has been a really interesting um, uh, jumpstart to thinking about how much the behavior is of uh, early humans before we came along the scene and how far this was happening in other areas of the planet. Uh, new data comes along all the time. And of course, the finds are relatively recent in 2015. So let the dust settle, gang. 
uh, before making any final judgments. But one thing that can be said is that the side that's actually doing the rigorous work ain't the creationists. And all you're getting from them is just pigeonholing and carping. Um, uh, well, we got um, frustrated stepping out there. We'll be back. Um, the Immutable Destiny says, source citation thing gets confusing for uh, me because as a chemist, you usually just cite the source as it's used in the article. Yeah, there's, there's varying methods that you find. For example, from a scholarly methods point of view, it, it bothers me that science citations tend not to list page numbers. So you could have a long monograph that's 80 pages or a book that's 400 pages. And in a typical science article, they will only list the citation as the direct citation and not specify page number. And that just drives me nuts if I'm trying to find a particular detail in that. Uh, I got to plow through the whole thing. But that's just the nomenclature of what happens typically in technical science works. Um, they're uh, usually not doing things for authority quoting. Technical citation, of course, is done for uh, just data points. And uh, the thing is, is that when some uh, creationists will say, well, do you fact check your science work? Well, functionally, yeah, because when I'm tracking down science data points and I'm seeing, oh, here's a technical article that's discussing one matter. And along the way, there's something else in it. They go, "Ooh, that's interesting. So I look up that source. That's what I did a, a lot in uh, Evolution Slam Dunk. And when you discover that the technical paper does in fact say the thing that the technical citation said it said, well, that's a measurement of their reliability as source citers. And when you find that when you look up a primary source that a creationist cites, and it's not really saying what they claim it is, it's, it's leaving masses of information out relative to what they've reported on it, then that's a very different kettle of fish. And you only find that out when you read primary sources. Uh, and so I, I strongly recommend that everybody adopt the practice, even if uh, you're not necessarily source checking everything. Who the hell has time for that? But you can, everybody will have things they're really knowledgeable about and interesting in. Uh, ideally, everybody should have like litmus tests, which is a, a topic that you know inside out. And that when you you know how it's a it's a controversial matter for the people you're criticizing that that um, uh, in one case one of the first litmus tests I ever uh, came up with was the Great Pyramids when I was studying stuff on ancient astronauts and crap and so I knew that the pyramids are in fact built by Khufu uh, Cheops uh, we got verification of that because uh, of the, all the archaeology that's been done including. Uh, that quarry stone up in the relieving chamber that had a cartouche from Khufu's reign on it and from the 17th year of his reign. And so it's just nonsense to imagine that that wasn't built when Khufu was alive. Um, anybody that claims that somebody else built the pyramids at some drastically different period has got to deal with that data set. So it's a litmus test, therefore, uh, that Khufu built the Great Pyramid. And uh, you can find various things in biology, in uh, paleontology, in astrophysics, uh, in chemistry, in your case, in other areas. Chemistry is going to be uh, kicking up into uh, molecule formation and um, uh, uh, electron bonding. And if that bump, that's going to be bumping into origin of life material in a, in a very visceral way, it's no coincidence that uh, James Tour, who is um, uh, a religious a skeptic of natural origins of life, uh, is a chemist. So he's looking at it from purely a chemical uh, base and any theoretical chemist should be able to come at that same field from the same level he's coming at it, even if he's, uh, and maybe get past him in terms of dealing with how the chemistry is showing up in a uh, natural origin of amino acids and formaldehyde and all these other things that are going on in the technical literature. And a chemist would have uh, a, an advantage there to me, whose only chemistry was taken way back in high school, and I have to therefore catch up to speed. So everybody's got areas of, of expertise that they can draw on. And the more you ground it in primary sources to where you're aware of what the technical literature is on the science side, and you're aware of what the anti-evolution position is using that or trying to use that argument on their side, and you can put them in the vice of what their claims are versus what the data field says. And the primary source is where that battle is fought. And, and so in any particular area that you're interested in, jump in on that. Um, uh, Immutable Destiny says, there's a typical rule for making presentations and report. If you're using less than 10 sources, sometimes less based on how heavy the presentation gets, you don't have enough data back your claim up. Uh, yeah, that there's, 
um, uh, especially when you get into really extensive technical literature, uh, Lordy B, there's a lot of citations to play around with. And uh, you find a rare number of creationists who play on that data heavy field. Uh, Andrew Snelling and Jeffrey Tompkins are two that come to mind right off the bat, both of them younger creationists. And their technical work will have lots of references in them and they can go on for pages. Uh, so tracking all that stuff down, which is what I do with the TIP project um, uh, to document that for the first time is uh, laborious. And uh, that's why uh, sometimes I get a few more gray hairs and uh, sometimes I'm slow on commenting on things on Twitter uh, and, and slow getting back to Jackson Weed on particular points because all of these different balls in the air of working on uh, multiple books at the same time and prepping for the evolution hour and then following the incoming technical literature and tracking all of that stuff down. Because the goal with TIP and someday I'd like to see this a bigger project with more than just me, so that this can be an ongoing thing to create if at the original website or some mere group of it at a new website get grants or something or other or or a, a bigger patreon thing dedicated to that aspect of it to act as a team where we're um really getting a grip on all of that science material that creationists have been using I have masses of material that I've accumulated and only a tiny portion of it, the stuff that I did in the old tip work and the stuff that I'm deploying in the new work, uh, Evolution Slam Dunk, which if you haven't got my book, damn it, what's slowing you up? Uh, get it and, and read it and spread it around and tell people about it. Um, check to see if your local library can get it, if you can't afford it, uh, and what, whatever can be done. Uh, and uh, because the information doesn't do diddly uh, if you, it isn't being known and it isn't being used. Um, uh, had uh, Jackson Wheat been here today, uh, we would probably have been giving a little press about what we've been doing with the rocks are, uh, were there. He's currently working on uh, chapters seven and eight, and I'm reviewing the chapter six that he's done, and I'm also sketching out now my chapter nine on flood geology. And insects are cool. I un well understand that, yes. I don't want anybody to um, uh, have to... Um, uh, decide between getting my damn book and eating or paying bills. Uh, but at any rate, there's I do have a lot of followers and there are a lot of people out there. So at the very least, retweet and tell people about it um, because it's a, a, a thing where I'm very proud of the book and I think it's a legitimate contribution to this anti-creationism literature that deserves to be made note of more. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can read um, uh, uh, Christine Janice's review on Amazon uh, to tell about that. But anyway, any rate, uh, the uh, 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 Rocks uh, Were There uh, project is uh, with Jackson Wheat to do for the Answers in Genesis Answers books what I did with Evolution Slam Dunk, which is just dismantle the whole area in careful rigor and with up-to-date material. And it's, it's going to be juicy. We've been having fun with it. Uh, it's uh, we're coming up with some very well written sections and um, it's uh, going to be very, very comprehensive to be discussing not only the creation geology and the cosmology and uh, that, but vast material on the biology claims and paleontology. It, it's delightful. And uh, both of us are um, um, venturing in a very tight new territory in the documentation level. And I'm uh, at my end because of my familiarity with the anti evolution literature. I want to make sure that as much ancillary stuff. For example, if a particular topic is brought up that we're dragging that in in footnotes and that to say, oh, and by the way, Kent Hobian was making this similar claim and this creationist is making this similar claim. So as we demolish the primary point, we are carrying a bunch of people down with us. So um, uh, immutable destiny, don't be like Jensen, don't let your primary argument be, what does my book say? Uh, yeah, the, the, the whole point about, in fact, I've been criticized uh, by a, a, an idiot online uh, who was uh, saying, well, all you're doing is just repeating what other people say. You don't have any thinking of your own. Excuse me, no. Anybody who reads my work should realize, no, I'm doing an awful lot of my own thinking and, and my own construction of things. But I'm, I'm also, it, it, the whole point of source methods analysis is examining how people construct arguments and what evidence they use and what they don't and how they deal with that. How much of the data field do they account for? And um, uh, Evolution Slam Dunk was specifically tailored for the reptile mammal transition because nobody had done this before and I felt it needed to be done. Uh, rocks were there, will be, a, we'll try to, we're trying to structure it so it'll end up about the same size as 
slam dunk, but we'll be covering a hell of a lot of material. And uh, you will know things about systematics, you'll know things about um, biology and the mechanics of things and, and adaptations and mutation rates. Uh, it, it's just a, a plethora of material that's out there and pulling it together in a entertaining but very firm way to demonstrate just why we think the creationist movement is such a crock and why we are not impressed with their arguments, why we think that they don't account for a damn thing, that they're stumbling around every topic they try to bring up, they're messing it up. And uh, the, the things they leave out, well, we're gonna tell you about and make it available through the source material so that you can track that stuff down too. And I can guarantee you the vast majority of the technical literature is available online somewhere or other accessible. And I know this because I don't have a whole lot of money to buy stuff. So uh, I know how accessible that stuff is. And I've been doing that very thing in this evolution hour. So um, we're, I'll, I'll go ahead and do my shameless plug here slightly early because I've got a couple more subjects that I want to deal with. So let me get my, my um, uh, screen share bit going on. RJ goes through the pathetic ritual of going through screen share. And sometimes this has been a little balky on the screen sharing thing. And uh, uh, there's been st stuff with the new um, YouTube formatting that they've been changing formats. And uh, this has been a little bit awkward. Uh, it hasn't always been working well. And so I am as yet trying to find... It is not wanting to do that. Let me see what I got. Let's put that here and try that. There we go. That should, there we go. That, that's coming up. It's, it's menu is functioning a little differently than what I'm using at. Uh, these are the patrons, the kind and wonderful people who have put up uh, actual scratch money uh, to help out at the project. And I've had the link up in, as usual, in the uh, video description, but I'll also be putting it up in here. So the colleagues, Hendrel and Eric Rowley, and our research level, Keith Garden and Fino and Brad and Ralph and Meet Convert Me and Pologia, good old Pologia, who has been spurring a lot of people and is a wonderful inspiration. If you don't follow his channel, he has way more viewers than I have. Uh, definitely do so. He's, he's uh, um, uh, a, a wonderful, amiable Canadian. Aren't many Canadians amiable uh, who um, uh, makes it a um, task of his to call a, to account the stupidity of answers in Genesis. And his ham and eggs shows are just wonderful. And uh, Tsur and then our assistant researchers, Dyer and Duranku and James and Kyle and Nana, who is in the feed right as we watch Staggles and Cirrus. I'm, I'm lagging behind on doing the audio book for uh, Paralogs of Fog, but it's been um, busy, busy beaver here. And uh, I hope to get back to that in the next uh, weeks when I can stay up late and it's warmer here. And uh, anyway, well, one thing at a time. And Toda's Real, and then our friends, Eat and Stephen and Marigale and Insects are cool. Hi, Insects, you're there. Thank you very much. And uh, Daniel Johnson and Bo and Alex and uh, Paul and Zeshi, and then some legacy patrons, Jen and John and Andrew and Mona and Sun Sky and Everett, who uh, were able to help earlier and financial circumstances changed for them and they weren't able to do so. But everything that has been helping, I am never other than grateful for everybody who helps on this. And and then um, just for the final things, there's the website. It's a clunky little WordPress thing, nothing fancy. It cost me absolutely nothing. And in fact, uh, a friend of mine is the one that actually hosts it online. Uh, and I'm still clunky at updating uh, of elements on that. And I, I say I'm sorry uh, on that. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to get better as time goes by. But the primary things that I've been focusing on are the writing of the books uh, where I'm able to get stuff out and available for people in a way that both revenue generating for me and also tightly packaged structure uh, for everybody else. Uh, here's the Patreon site uh, where you can uh, help out in there at any level that you want. And recurring stuff is just, it makes a huge difference uh, as a social security retiree. And then we've also got uh, GoFundMe.com uh, DCGo where you can also do the same thing. You can do recurring stuff or one spot stuff. And that also uh, moves smoothly as uh, that thing works. So um, uh, either one of those, any way you can help and the books and all the rest, uh, there we go. So there's my shameless plug for the day and uh, back to the actual content of things. Um, as you may have been spotting, I usually do like a double feature thing where there's the main topic and then there's stuff that's popping up along the way. 
And uh, uh, it usually is material that I'm bumping into in the course of uh, doing the anti-creationism research. So that was the case with this bit about Kent Hobian. Uh, in fact, it was a matter of um, some video commentary that was being done criticizing Kent Hovind that along the way, they were pointing out some of his weird usages of dated source material. And I was kind of looking up on that. One of the ones that Kent Hovind made use of was uh, an old Scientific American article, which I happen to have down. I was a fight, actually was subscribed to uh, Scientific American for quite a few years. So I had the October 1992 issue physically there to get to. And uh, uh, it turned out it was a quote mind about this uh, fellow uh, Windhorst on um, star formation and how no one knew how it was done. Well, the very dated nature of that date, 1992, suggested, yeah, what were they talked about what we didn't know about? And what they were actually talking about was dealing with very early star formation early in the universe. This is in the early stages of Big Bang uh, modern cosmology, and that was exactly what it was talking about. And so I put a technical paper by that same scientist from about uh, 12 years later to give you a sense of how far the field had moved on from then. And of course, that's a long time ago now. We know a great deal more about the subject matter of stars, and they're constantly refining their understandings of, of how they form and what the role of magnetic fields and gas interactions and uh, of the coalescence factors of black holes, which they didn't even realize back in, in 1992. And the thing is, is that Kent Hovind has no excuse whatsoever for being gobsmackingly ignorant on this, that all he's doing is getting trawling quotes. And in fact, I'm pretty sure he got it from Walt Brown because I tracked down the quote he was using and it was showing up both of the cosmology quotes that he was doing in the little video that the um, um, critics were analyzing. Uh, I can't remember whether it was Pelogia or one of the others that was going into it. Um, it, may, it may have been on a non sequitur show. Uh, they had a whole, uh, yes, in fact, that was, I think uh, was it, Ard Ra was uh, uh, on non sequitur and they were talking about uh, some of these things and investigating stuff. So they didn't have the linkage directly up for the video that they were dealing with. And I was just going by the little frames. And, um, uh, oh, no, no, I'll take that back. Brain fart. It was on Psy Strikes thing because I remember asking them to stop the video. Yes, it was the old Kent Hill video we just did. See, I'm old RJ is getting pathetic here. Uh, and so I actually told them to stop the video so that I could write down what the quotes were and, and track down all that. So the, the thing was that um, uh, Hovind is doing this in the 21st century. And it literally never occurs to him that he needs to track down something more recent than a secondary authority quote that he got from Walt Brown. He treats Walt Brown as an oracle. So he's a, a bottom feeder and an uncurious one. And since I was able to find technical literature on this from the same author in literally seconds, once I did some searching on it, um, why couldn't he? Well, because he's lazy and, and he doesn't know how to use sound method. Uh, uh, Korag says, uh, uh, Kent Hovind's excuse for being ignorant on star formation and black hole and planet formation is the fact that it doesn't re require his God. Yeah, this has been um, a problem for young Earth creationists who want to mush everything together. And Kent Hovind is a definite musher, that there's evolution, the six stages of evolution. He goes for that kind of an argument where stellar evolution is seen as part of this big worldview. Uh, that's purely naturalistic. Well, the problem is, is it works. And the physics is very sophisticated and very advanced. And uh, what few creationists have astrophysics cred haven't gotten very far in explaining anything as a competitor. You've got somebody like you, Ross, who's an old earth creationist who has some astrophysics knowledge, and he's not disputing any of the physical processes. To the contrary, he's saying how clever God was to make the system uh, do all this stuff uh, without intervention. Uh, but um, it's a, a different problem for ones that don't want atoms to be formed in nucle uh, nucleosynthesis inside of stars, that the reason why we have the elements that we do is a long, multi-billion year long process of form stellar formation and supernovas and stellar collisions and neutron stars and masses of things producing all sorts of interactions that uh, in the course of their interactions make these heavier and heavier elements over time. And uh, we've actually seen now um, gold having been produced in a supernova that's been observed by uh, stellar astrophysicists looking at their spectral things from uh, exploding stars. 
So this has moved beyond the hypothetical stage and Kent is 8,000 miles back behind drawing on a non-astrophysicist Walt Brown who just kind of trawls old material and then gets repeated by Kent Hovind. It's terrible. Uh, the other one that I put in was um, um, David Capege. Uh, oh, Puffalophagus, yes. Are you saying the uh, one-way speed of light isn't a real thing? That That's one of the things that, that does pop up in creationist apologetics is uh, uh, the peskiness of how do you measure the speed of light when with a single instrument? And what you have to do is you have to measure it bounce off something or send a signal back. So basically you're measuring out and back in order to avoid the relativistic internal consistency problems. And... Uh, um, there are some uh, uh, astrophysicists in the uh, creationist community that play off of that to uh, Jason Lyle, for example, uh, who play off of that to discredit standard cosmology without ever really coming up with a workable counter model that persuades anybody other than the people in their little network that's already persuaded and therefore they're easy cells. And there's been an enormous amount of, of uh, goalpost moving um, creationists have a problem, or anybody has a problem trying to refute relativity theory uh, because it works. And our GPS systems make use of it. And we can uh, physically measure uh, time dilation uh, with atomic clocks. You put them up on an airplane, fly the airplane around a while, the, the uh, clock that was on the plane is behind the one that's on the ground. And so it's just a hell of a lot of data in this area. You find some relativity skeptics, and they tend to be wacky cranks. And so it's a, a, a tread warily area for uh, young Earth creationists. But the, 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 the area in cosmology has just as much data points now and direct observations that they're in the same boat, pardon the pun, arc boat, uh, that the um, uh, systematics for taxonomy are uh, regarding life and genetics that just as we have a vast amount of paleontology data and a vast amount of genetic data, we have a vast amount of astronomical data on a scale that's just mind-blowing compared to what I uh, was aware of when I was growing up in the 1950s. Uh, the fact that we can physically observe things in distant galaxies that we didn't even know existed uh, when I was growing up and find uh, evidence about planets and what kind of atmospheres they have and all of this stuff is on, a, on a scale uh, that is just astonishing. And creationists are never going to catch up. The, the data field was hard to accommodate back in 1980, uh, and it's not gotten any easier. So what you're watching in any discipline is to see what they're leaving out and how much they can data parse. It's a dead giveaway when they're relying on really old sources and worse, secondary sources. So the fact that a Kent Hovind is going to be trotting out a Scientific American article from 1992 is a, a, a serious indication that there's no there there for them to cite. And Kant is not really that knowledgeable on any of the science matters, uh, so that he really is probably kind of leery of drawing too much on the technical material that's being done by Jason Lyle and others. Then it does get technical on their side. It's not persuasive, but it's a fun thing to go. Uh, that's an area that um, I'm treading into now by nature, force, uh, because I'm um, assigned uh, the uh, cosmology sections of the answers book uh, that Jason said, so, uh, uh, that Jackson has given me. So I'm working off on that, uh, and therefore I have to catch up with things that have been kind of on the back burner because I'm more interested in paleontology and the developmental biology and genetics aspects. So I haven't really uh, ferreted out uh, at source level so much of that uh, field before, but diving into it now, there we go. Um, Proceeding with that. Uh, oh, uh, um, AK virus, we are literally star stuff. Uh, don't attribute that to Lawrence Krauss, though. Actually, I think Carl Sagan was the one that made use of that. We are literally star stuff. We're made of stardust, uh, which is true. Uh, and in fact, we are a fabulous amalgam because some of us uh, um, are, uh, some of our matter, the hydrogen part, all, we're 70% water, and water is H2O. The hydrogen in that is as old as the universe. It was formed in the Big Bang. Uh, I don't think a hell of a lot of hydrogen comes from any other process other than that. So parts of us are 13.8 billion years old. The oxygen is billions of years younger coming from main sequence stars in supernovas. And then the, the, 
the stray stuff that's the rest left over are of a various age. So we're at a tremendous uh, um, uh, pile up of stuff from varying ages. And therefore, our own bodies can be an illustration not only of the reptile mammal transition with the jaw issue, but from the very constituent elements in us are a testament to a bigger level cosmology. Aha. Uh, Puffalophagus says, uh, what portion of uh, YECs do you estimate know that they're lying to get a paycheck? I'd say very few. I'd say it, uh, at best, maybe a handful. And I can't really even think offhand of any of the major ones that would fall into that category. Uh, when you look at ex-creationists who are usually raised in the field and then have a realization that, uh-oh, I believe something that was crap, uh, they aren't uh, um, doing this for money. Uh, and in fact, these little mom and pop creationists that set up these little muta museums, uh, there's one down in uh, uh, Boise and the, the Glendive Museum and all of that, they're, they're not expensive operations. They're not making a hell of a lot of money. They sometimes don't even charge admission. They just go by donations. This is not a moneymaker for them. They have passion. And I don't think for a moment that the major lights in the creationism movement are any different than that. The ones that manage to make money, that adds a new layer of rationalization to where now they have a market incentive never to change their mind. But I don't think their minds are ever going to change anyway. And the fact that that Ken Ham's pulling down, what, 150, 200,000 a year uh, at Answers in Genesis makes him feel happy, uh, I'm sure, and, and gratified and, and enabled. But I don't think that many of them are charlatans in that sense. And I know there are people in the anti-creationism community that are just convinced of it. Uh, Steve McRae is just absolutely sure that's, that uh, Steve Austin is uh, doing this as bullshitting that he knows that what he's saying is wrong and he's just doing it for religious apologetics. And then quite a few are of the opinion that either Kent Hovind or Ken Ham uh, are um, just charlatans who know what they're saying is bullshit and they're doing it because they're raking in money. But um, uh, that Ken Ham or Kent Hovind is, a, is a, an example of somebody that basically plows all of his money back into his mom and pop claptrap. He wants to have his little museum where he can have kids come and see the wonders of creation. And if he had more money to do it, he would. But he's not living in fancy digs. He's living in a, a dumped down little house. Uh, he's got squiggled up some land. He's made use of volunteers as best he can. And as somebody who scrapes by from week to week, month to month on my own resources, I can see exactly that same attitude in there. So I'm, I'm a charitable sort, and I'm personally of the opinion that, that very few anti-evolutionists don't believe what they say, no matter how cushy their lifestyle is. Steve uh, Meyer, who pulls down at least 150 grand there at the Discovery Institute, I do not for a moment think that he doubts what he believes. But when you look at how they construct their arguments, when we look at their ability of their brains to just not think about core issues, to never really work out what they think happened. It's an anti-evolution argument, not a pro-intelligent design. They don't really work out that aspect. Uh, I can easily see how that accounts for everything. Uh, Puffalophagus is convinced that Ken Am is a sociopathic scam artist. Uh, same with Banana Man, by which uh, referring to um, uh, Kent Hovind. And, uh, I, and I will respectfully disagree on that point. Uh, if they ever write a mea culpa, uh, someday, you know, um, uh, then and have a thing where they're saying, no, I, I really was just bullshitting. Then I'll change my mind on that. But I really don't think so. Uh, Insects are cool. Also says, I think some are liars, some are honest. Uh, what involves is the whole mechanism. And this is why source methods is really a core cognitive issue. It's how do people believe things that aren't true? What do their brains do when they do that? And uh, when I did the tip project initially, I was approaching this from a, 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 the Scientific American National Geographic level with just occasional forays in the, into the technical literature because so much of it wasn't available easily. But I could very quickly spot certain traits, one of which was that they don't talk about certain topics. They don't conceptualize certain things. Speciation is one of them. What a transitional form would need to look like to change their mind. And that gradually coalesced into that, what would change their mind? And it turns out nothing that they can't eat. Their brains can't even imagine that sort of a thing. And when you're coming from an outside point of view, if you look at people who did finally change their minds, it's because they really could change their mind. They, they, were, they were thinking that the evidence was one thing, 
And eventually they realized that they were not dealing with most of the evidence, that they were sold a bill of goods. That's when they have their epiphany and cease to be young earth creationists. And, and so it's my contention is that, that Tortukans can be creationists to the dying day and can be craven about how they deal with stuff. Now there are instances in which there are anti-evolutionists who are so tactical in stuff that they are talking about that you have to think there's a degree of mendacity about it. And that does in fact occur. Um, uh, Philip Johnson parsed a paragraph and I described it in, um, uh, I think in the old um, uh, uh, Three Mac Revolutionary episodes. And I know I went into it in um, one of the chapters in Old Tip. I think it was in chapter four uh, on the um, uh, um, misrepresentation of uh, Steven Weinberg, where one little sentence was nicked out, just one. And that was so tactical that it had to be done consciously. It wasn't accidental. You don't remove one sentence from a long paragraph uh, that just happens to make it easier for you to make your apologetic argument uh, unless you did so tactically. Dwayne Gish was a tactician that you could see him plow through 500 pages of that gigantic Arthur Strahler book and he nicks out just the little snippets that he can use apologetically to support his argument. That's that's tactical and misrepresentative, but it's, it's, it's conscious in a way that is very um, uh, suggestive that there's parts of their brain that know the minefields. Gish, for example, didn't like discussing young earth creationism arguments. He didn't like discussing radiometric dating and geology. He would occasionally, but, but several critics had pointed out that he tended to avoid that. He went on fossils and that argument. He was more comfortable with that. And that suggests the Tortukan ruts. Uh, hi, oh, Terry Davis, bye. Uh, you can catch the remainder of the show later or, or uh, however is the case may be. Um, uh, 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 AKA virus brings up Dan Barker. Yeah, well, I, it, he was just in uh, uh, Spokane and the, and the area uh, doing some lectures and that. And he will tell you the degree to which there was a, a, an element of self-deception in his own mind. And uh, But yeah, I wouldn't classify as somebody that was just doing bullshitting. He believed it. He was a true believer. There are mechanisms for dissembling, however. And uh, an example of the one that comes to mind that, that tells how this could happen in a scientific context, uh, one of my favorite classic science fiction movies is um, uh, uh, Crater Mass in the Pit. It's also known as Five Million Years to Earth. And there's uh, a scene in it where there's this Martian spaceship that's buried down in a subway excavation and it's really dangerous. It's coming to life. It's a machine that has its activities all on its own. And these idiot uh, ones that won't realize there's something dangerous about it are just bringing in their attaching power conduits and stuff that this is just a disaster. And there's gonna be all these people that can be hurt on it down in the subway. So he is trying to get them out. And uh, accidentally, one of the um, uh, reporters uh, is uh, uh, burned from the electrical equipment that they've got down in there. It actually didn't have a damn thing to do with the spaceship, but it was an excuse that Quatermass used to say, well, see what happened to him, get out. And so he was using it as an option to get people to do something that he didn't actually yet have direct evidence that there was anything dangerous about the machine other than the stuff that they've been investigating about people hallucinating things and other stuff. And so uh, it, it's actually an interesting method study about how, how do you prove a, an amazing thing? How do you show that something, I mean, the, the argument in the story that there are these Martians that uh, died out millions of years ago, but colonized the earth by proxy with these mutant apes. And it's a, it was an ingenious story. It came about the same time as 2001, which was about a similar topic of aliens intervening in human evolution along the way. Anyway, that was an example of, of the kind of thing that can happen where you get in advance. To, uh, uh, some climate scientists are prone. Uh, Paul Ehrlich has been this for years. He tends to be a, a, a Cassandra and often makes off the cuff, over the top predictions. Is the guy lying? Well, he often skirts past data field and, and jumps past information maybe. And so is that not the same phenomenon that we're seeing uh, with uh, creationists? So there, there we are. And, and so I'm, I, if you can accuse me of being too kindly to people, but I give people the benefit of the doubt. And unless they uh, can be caught in, in clearly mendacious activity uh, and not merely, um, apologetic data suppression, but um, corrupt data suppression, 
uh, to where they really don't believe that they're caught saying, you know, oh, I don't believe this clap trap about Noah's Ark, but boy, we're sure making money on it. No, I don't think that has ever been passing through Kent Hovind or Ken Ham's mind. And uh, uh, there's more than enough. Uh, never attribute to uh, uh, mendacity what can be attributed to uh, incompetence. And uh, I'm willing to do that with the Tortukan mind shell because you can see brilliant people. When you look at the at the inability of very bright people like Philip Johnson or Dwayne Gish was no stupid either, uh, who just don't think through a lot uh, and they can't really conceptualize changing their mind, that that's a big door that opens for an awful lot of their apologetic arguments on here. And there's also a track record that we have of anti-evolutionism, which is an advantage, that we've got people that went through their entire life down to their dying day. And we've got a, a, a huge amount of right, written material from Dwayne Gish and Henry Morris and before him, Harry Rimmer and um, uh, all the stuff from George McCready Price that you can give a measurement about how few of these people either ever come and say, gee whiz, I uh, uh, don't believe it anymore, let alone that I was lying about it when I said it. And I can't think of any major anti-evolutionist that falls into that category. So there's that little side issue. Now, now the other point that I had in the listing for linkages was our, uh, David Kopej and uh, this brand new paper. Kopej is one of these ones, if you, if you have the misfortune of seeing his website, it's a long spurt of gotcha gee whiz snarks at uh, the incoming science literature. And he's a young earth creationist, although that topic doesn't come up all that often. He's usually just scarping about anti-evolutionism. He occasionally will mention fossils. And so he popped up in slam dunk because he blundered into uh, a reptile mammal transition example. Uh, but his area is more cosmological and he often goes into that, but he does go in biology. And this one was on this technical paper on uh, how mitochondria make use of uh, ATPase, which is um, a little energy source uh, in the cells. And um, uh, Copage's argument was, see, this is creation and they're not mentioning anything at all about evolution in here. It's just uh, the science and, and this actually would be supporting creation, not evolution. Well, boy, technical argument articles at that level don't discuss necessarily the whole big picture. It doesn't mean that the people writing the thing doubt that ATPs develop naturally, the mitochondria are in our cells because of endosymbiosis. That's not an area that they're talking about. Uh, that's not a point of it. In the same reason that when you get the instruction manual for a new light fixture, it does not have a detailed history of the General Electric Company and the development of electric power grid. No, this is not something that pops up. And this was what would be a, a highly focused technical, this is what it does bit. And uh, whether or not any of this is gonna help there, well, research ATPAs. And uh, um, it's a very deep old system that relates to how photosynthesis is using and electron exchanges and all that. And it, it, there's quite a large technical literature on this subject, which Copage doesn't pay any attention to. Uh, I didn't want to deluge everybody with that subject matter, but I thought that that new paper is kind of fun. It gives you a, a sense of the incoming technical literature and if you could easily, if you are of a mind to, uh, look up any of the little components that are discussed along the way and see what's been done in the other technical literature on that. If that's a, an area that you find fascinating, uh, follow up on it because you'll discover lots of stuff and put it into perspective. And you'll probably discover that most of this isn't ever going to hit on the anti-evolution scope because other than just saying because, uh, they don't really have an explanation for why any of this happens. Uh, the um, uh, some comments then from uh, uh, Korag. Uh, I'm so tired of life from non-life arguments from young earth creationists. There's a difference between non-living materials and dead materials. Yeah, and it's it's what I've been calling uh, origins or bust. And please use that. It's a handy little phrase that sums up the whole bit. That I came up with that in um, particularly in Slam Dunk, and I. Um, I'm, I've been using it fairly regularly ever since, if I can get my little cursor here. Origins are bust because it's the the dodge they, whoops, origins or, not of. I keep on hitting that damn F on my keyboard because some of the things are invisible. Origins are bust. Um, it's the way they avoid thinking about everything else. If somebody brings up an, um, an origins argument, it's they don't want to think about the reptile mammal trend.
transition. They don't want to think about retrotransposons. They don't want to think about the radiometric dating or the geology of the earth. They, that's not what they want. They want to say, well, you can't explain why life existed. So, ah, uh ah, -uh, there you go. And it's a dodge. And usually they're getting their material secondarily from anti-evolution sources. It doesn't make the reptile mammal transition go away. It's not that it isn't a legitimate and interesting subject, but it isn't required for evolution. Doesn't matter how life originated. It could have been a miracle. And, but it was a miracle that took place 4 billion years ago, and it's a miracle that produced only bacteria. And from that point on, we can study the evolution part of it. And uh, if, if origins or bust is being invoked, and it almost invariably is, as a way not to think about what happened after that, because they don't know what they think happened after that. They haven't conceptualized it in their own head. And that's that map of time problem, number three on my lesson, lessons of Tortugan iniquities. Uh, I will repeat them again. Um, repetition and ed education here. Uh, Over-reliance on secondary sources. You don't fact check. That's a scholarly matter. Uh, core fact claimants that are very few in number and, and are very limited data field. Uh, then the uh, met, uh, the cognitive issues are the map of time. They don't work out what they think happened because none of the people they read have actually worked that out either. They don't. They can't. So they they're they're a critic of the status quo, not a positive argument of what they think happened. And then lastly, the critical one: what would change their mind? Nothing. They can't even imagine evidence that would change their mind. They don't allow evidence to change their mind. So uh, the um, oh. Um, Antediluvian atheist says dead giveaway when you're talking about evolution and they go evolution, macroevolution, biogenesis, big bang proof reality is real. That's kind of the slippery slope it goes on. And uh, uh, Jay Katz and and um, uh, quite a few in the uh, uh, Twitter community, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see me jousting with them all the time. And so as my response is to use that tag, I go, oh, he's on origins or bust again. Well, well, isn't that a surprise? And that allows you, ideally, the reason why I use Twitter platform is I want to uh, get into side conversations. It happens not nearly as much as I'd like to see, and I'd like to see it happen a lot with everybody. It's that you're not there to persuade them that they're wrong. You're there to bear witness for what the reality is and use that as an education opportunity. And you may usually find that the target your creationist goes silent running because they can't get in that discussion. They can't respond. Or if they do, it's just snarky comments. And then you can use that in the enfilade between you and the other person to say, oh, you see what just happened here? Uh, it brought out the same little argument they did before. Uh, they never give sources. They don't check on anything. Meanwhile, and you're discussing science data. You're discussing the cutting edge. You're explaining things. You're explaining why things are the way they are and where the new research is going. And you can use that as an education opportunity. Uh, that And there will be people following along who'll just be sitting there and they won't say a thing. But hopefully there'll be some of them who will be looking at this ping pong match and seeing that the creationists are getting nowhere and the pro science people are saying stuff and making sense and learning and talking about things uh, and, and do it jovially. Uh, I, I don't use profanity. I don't use insult. Uh, my, uh, I'm typically, and if I do occasionally go to that level, it's because they've done something really nasty where they suddenly start bringing in the Holocaust and Hitler and other things, or you can veer off into abortion issues and the like, where they can start getting intense and I may get a little bit uh, testier. But most of the time I'll pop in with a incorrect and explain why it's incorrect. And occasionally we'll, we'll get these proper source material uh, and, and with every assurance that it will be something that I can link to as a primary source that they can get to full text. I have one particular one that I keep in reserve uh, which is uh, Lowe's uh, 2011 review of the reptile mammal transition uh, jaw ear issue. And it's just chock-a-block with technical stuff. And yet it's an, a relatively straightforward, easy read. And it's by a major researcher in the field, Lowe from the Carnegie Museum in Chicago. So he is not, or Pittsburgh. And so he's no slouch in this area. And you're never going to get a, a, the creationist to address any of that data. They're just going to snark at it and huff and puff. At which point you can say, that's all they're doing. And you can say, they're, they're never addressing these data because they can't. They're too lazy to read the damn thing. They're, they're, they have no model to explain. And so now you're on that map of time conceptualization frame.
So if you show that you know that data field and they don't, and they can't ever respond because they don't know the data field and they can't even conceptualize what their model is. So they can't address these issues. Uh, you can be a, 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 a learning tool for the innocent bystanders that are watching this ping pong match. And instead of just being seeing an, an, a firing match of insults where, well, you believe in talking snakes and that, I think that kind of an approach is absolutely useless because it turns off just as many people as it might persuade. So there we go. Um, Andy Luby and Atheist says, dead, uh, dead giveaway. Oh, I see. Uh, um, uh, Lisa for Truth, what about Hovind? Uh, I use source methods. I put the link up because uh, more people need to see exactly what I did. Uh, I had a debate with Kent Hovind, and I'm using source methods with him. Kent Hovind is the ultimate ideologue. He is an ultimate parasite. He is a lower echelon secondary source redactor from square one, and he's been that way for decades. But he has a huge following, and he has a positive um, uh, um, rote well-rehearsed pitter-patter that he has been trotting out over and over and over again for decades. And uh, um, Peter, uh, who did the graphics, uh, my little clickety-clack um, steampunky graphics for the opening of the show, uh, is convinced or was convinced that nobody could benefit from be uh, debating Hovind because he's just impervious. He just has his thing down. Well, I showed that that wasn't correct. Uh, Hovind had his PowerPoints all prepared. He spent, uh, I, I watched him do it because we, uh, before the show went live, uh, and he spent a lot of ticky tubble getting everything all organized. And he made the disastrous mistake of letting me go first. Not that it would have mattered. I would have slightly altered my routine, uh, if he had gone first, because I actually anticipated what he was going to say before he said it. And I was going at him from a source methods point of view, uh, assailing his under, underlying scholarship, his reliance on Harun Yaya and all of that. And I derailed him. Uh, anybody that's seen a standard Ken Hovind thing should be able to see that he behaves differently. He's petulant and peeved. And he's trying to scavenge around to get back onto his track. And i he's off his track. And the critical factor is the end. Because uh, he always, 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 even with Aaron Ra, he ends his routines with an appeal to come to Jesus. And he didn't do that with me because he was just so rattled. So take a look and compare the difference on there. And he has not debated with me since. And I suspect it's very possible that he never will. Uh, but uh, now if you read the comments there and in other contexts, you'll find that the Hovindistas aren't, aren't persuaded by me. But I'm not expecting them to be persuaded by me. Excuse me, if you can take Kent Hovind seriously, you are already off the rails. So you are not going to, uh, Matt Powell, as an example, he still thinks Kent Hovind is wonderful, standing for truth, thinks Kent Hovind is wonderful. And uh, they're never going to change their mind because they have exactly the same failings that Kent Hovind does. But that's not why I was there. I was there to put on the field a source methods approach to this uh, circumstance, and I did exactly that. I set out to do that, and I think I acquitted myself reasonably well on it. Uh, and um, I was dubbed by Kent P. Vishley as the altar boy of atheism when I had not discussed God at all in the thing. This was purely on his bad scholarship. So um, uh, I put the link up to that in the video description, and more people have, uh, can see it. I think I'm up to 3,000 some odd, but that's a drop in the bucket compared to the people that see Aaron Ra videos or Pelogia uh, videos. He's in like 10, 20, 30,000 range. So uh, there's a long way to go. If you think that what I did with Kent Hovind was really noteworthy, let people know about it. Say, wow, you, Aaron Ra did a nice job uh, with Kent Hovind, but the problem is that he is not a source methods analyst. He doesn't come at his debates as a source methods approach. He His data floor, and he knows his data floor really well, but he just basically accuses Kent Hovind of lying all the time. When I'm looking at it from a source methods thing, no, nope, Kent Hovind's little Tartukan mind shell is still in place and you're throwing data floor at him and bouncing it off. And Hovind is trying to find his way back to his little safety comfort blanket. And that's how he responds to stuff. Well, I undermine the comfort blankets in a source methods approach because that's the underlying superstructure that's before you get to the data floor. And uh, Ra and uh, Steve McRae and others uh, that, have, that have debated him, uh, uh, Bill Hud uh, uh, Hud uh, Ludlow uh, did source methods 
he was prepared on that, and uh, he also did a very good job on it. But uh, Aaron doesn't really bother too much about where Kent gets his sources from. I do. And I contend that's the Achilles heel by looking at where they're getting their source methods from, like that Scientific American article that was up to speed and the various other uh, uh, matters. Uh, uh, Kent is a very pathetic uh, parasite. And the people who take him seriously are parasites just like him. So that's the, the source methods lesson to take home on that, that it works. Um, and uh, imagine a world in which Kent Hovind is bumping into hundreds, if not thousands of critics armed with source methods understanding to where they know his data feel better than he does, where they know all the literature they don't collectively and interconnect. So if somebody is going to debate Kent Hovind um, that is not aware of this stuff, they can find out through the network. Because uh, you, uh, if you're just going after Kent Hovind by watching one or two Kent Hovind videos, it can be very laborious because he's so frisky and scampering. But if you've studied more than just a few videos and or also the source data that he's drawing on, uh, particularly litmus test items he repeats over and over and over again. Uh, his very repetition is an advantage to where uh, Kent doesn't have many new songs and dances to play with. He, he does, he's trawling off of, of uh, Walt Brown most of the time and that's stuff that's decades old. So um, there's, a, there's an easy target aspect to him if you don't forget that source methods level. So there we go. And uh, we're just past six o'clock um, and I uh, should probably be uh, curtailing things. Any, any uh, questions or further comments in there um, that are uh, something that I want to address on this? Uh, I want to have that feedback aspect, which is why I like to have guests and that on the show to discuss, which we've had before with uh, including some science hitters uh, the, uh, from uh, Matt Heron and uh, um, Joshua Swamidas and others that have been on there. And, and I've, had discussions occasionally with creationists, some grassroots creationists like um, uh, oh, Nephilim just drives me nuts because he's such a hyper presuppositionalist and just bangs the same drum. He can't, you can't have a chat with him. He wants you to answer his question his way and you can't get past his roadblock um, approach on it. Those are annoying and useless people. Uh, C. Brown, who uh, haunts uh, the, if you've been following the comments that pop up in here, he he traipses in, usually a long time after the fact. He just obsesses on older ones, and you'll see him comment, 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 comment. He doesn't necessarily follow up on the current ones, uh, but he will eventually, and he'll be saying the same thing, that he's, he's absolutely certain he's absolutely flattened me, and he's completely demolished me, and there's nothing left of me, and I'm just uh, skulking off into a hole somewhere. Well, if it looks like I'm skulking off into a hole, it, I seem to have a pretty well-upholstered one, and I'm pretty much prone to respond to people, that I don't like letting them have the last word unless they're boring to death, in which case I'll go, yeah, we'll come back later. And that sometimes happens on Twitter, where there'll be some people that it's just pointless to discuss uh, PVSN, this positivism versus negativism, this man is an idiot. And uh, he just obsesses on skeptics all the time. And you can never figure out what the hell he means on anything. And it's a total waste of time to interact with him. So once in a while, I'll just pop up, oh, he's still at his gig, is he? Okay. If anybody can never come up with anything from him, that's valuable. So um, we're just past the hour. Uh, looks like there's nothing new on there. Uh, I'm still plowing away at things. I've got, oh, insect back. You're just back in time to see, uh, to, uh, say uh, goodbye on this. Um, I'm uh, hot at work on the Rocks uh, Were There book. Um, I want to make this one um, as just as much of a kick butt work as Slam Dunk was that anybody should be proud to have as an addition to their field because they will have information in it that's never been pulled together before uh, to act as a solid resource. And uh, I, uh, I realize that I'm just tiptoeing into the field here, but I would contend that my form of tiptoeing is striking into an area that has not been exploited well before. It's been touched on a little in like the uh, Talk Origins archive approach, but they didn't come at it from a full-blown source methods approach, which is to examine the entire underpinning of the anti-evolution argument base to measure things. So I can tell you categorically that anti-evolutionists as a group are only uh, bumping into 10% of the data field. 
And nobody's ever been able to measure that thing before, but I'm trying to do that continuously. And I will be continuingly to do that so long as I can. And hopefully someday uh, we will be able to build up, an, up a, a network that will be independent of me and the, the vast amounts of information that I've accumulated will be passed on to the caretakers who will follow me uh, and uh, uh, keep up that project because I don't want TIP to be a thing that RJ was doing until he dropped dead uh, and then poop it disappears. Uh, there's it's too important a task and there's too much information that's been accumulated, some of which I, I just grieve at the fact that when Jade, I'll call her that because that's how she was known online, she had gone through and tracked down old works that Kent Hovind and others had drawn on, and she had them in her archive personally, but it was in her archive, and she died suddenly, and it's gone. I have no clue where it's going to go, and it may end up in a junk pile somewhere from the curator of her estate. Who knows? But all of that information is just, boop, gone. And therefore, it, it, it's as if it never existed. I do, I'm trying as best I can to put things on the field, either from the online material I've done already and the books that I'm going to do, uh, uh, am doing and will continue to do as long as I can, to put at least some of that stuff and the method that goes with it on the field and eventually have people that will continue that process because it's powerful. It's a no-lose situation where everybody who participates in it learns by the process, their arguments become better, the creationists become more and more flustered and, and inadequate because they can't keep up with the data curve. And if we do, we're so far ahead of them, they're never going to be able to catch up. So I'll leave that as my last thoughts for the moment and uh, say thank you all for uh, uh, watching me dither dather in my uh, den here. Uh, uh, the temperatures may eventually reach the point where I won't have to worry about the sweater and that. Uh, it's been really cold and that. We finally got rid of the snow here and I'm now waiting for the grass to finally reemerge to the point where I can try out the new lawnmower, which I was able to buy thanks to you patron people. Uh, Lowe's had a really good deal on one and I was able to get that. So I'm, I'm able to proceed clunky, 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 one thing. AKA virus, knowledge is power, absolutely. It, it's not a, a, um, a be all and end all and it's not, uh, if somebody can shoot you and your knowledge didn't count for much. Violence can still do that. But we cannot achieve progress without a broadly based, well-educated population. And everybody plays that part. It's not something that's up to just the school system or the shows that you see on television or on media pundits. That's part of it. But you play a role and everybody down there to use sound method and to learn and to pass that on and in and show by the delight you show. I hope everybody can see. I love knowing interesting things. The universe is so fascinating. How can anyone be bored by that? No, gosh, it's absolutely astonishing. And uh, so I'm like a kid in a candy store, and I'm glad that I was able to survive into an, a time, even if it is during the Trump administration, where I'm able to um, uh, learn so much and talk to people and find out about so many things that I never thought I would be able to before. So I keep on saying I'm going to shut the show down and then keep on talking more. So we will now actually say bye and see you next week.